Hi, I want to show you some really awesome things that I've been working on. In fact, I proved a mathematical slash computer science conjecture, and I want to give the intuitive reasons why I was able to prove it. There's a preprint link in the description down below, which goes through the actual full proof, so there's no way I'm going to present all of it here. I want to give some intuition as to why my proof is actually correct. So in order to understand how this will work, you need to look at my covering array video, which I posted a few months ago, and the link will be right here. After you finish watching that, feel free to come back and watch this video. In that video, I define this covering array number quantity to be the minimum n such that a covering array on some parameters exists. So what's a covering array? It's a n by k array, so n rows here in k columns. And each of the entries within there is one of V possible values. So if like V is two, that would be a zero or a one in every single position. And what this T parameter says is that no matter what T columns you pick, you will have every single V to the T tuple appear at least once. So if we had, for example, V equal to two and T equal to four, like I have right here, then I need to see 0, 0, 0, 0 somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be in this first row, but I need to see it at least once. And then I may need to see 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, et cetera. And in this particular case, there will be 16 possible four tuples because I have two choices for each one of them. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. And what I proved in that last video is how big is this quantity? So what is proven and what I did in that video is that for V and T fixed, if I fix the number of values that you can see and the strength as it's called the T value, then this covering array number quantity can of TKV is going to be some constant times log K, asymptotically at least. And so if I have, let's say a billion columns, then that means that the number of rows I will need is going to be a logarithmic of a billion times a constant that depends on V and T, and that constant actually is pretty terrible. It's actually like V to the T, roughly exponential. And what I wanted to do is to generalize a proof. In mathematics, when we try to prove something, we want to prove a generalization of it. So the generalization is to look at a index. So here, I'm gonna put a lambda in the, in the subscript right here and a lambda over here. And what this lambda is, is instead of having every t tuple appear at least once, I'm gonna have it appear at least lambda times. And why would you want such a thing? If we have a non-deterministic testing environment, I wanna be able to run the same test multiple times and get more confidence in the system's correctness. If some test is invoking some random calls, then it may give a different answer each time that it's run. So if I run it a whole bunch of times, then that'll give me more confidence in the system's correctness. So what I wanted to figure out was, what is can lambda TKV, where V and T are fixed? And it's pretty easy to show that it's lambda times log K or less. And what's the reason for that? Well, what we can do is use the result that we figured out last time. The fact that if we have a covering array of so-called index one, where everything appears at least once, then we can use log k rows to make such a thing. And we can just do a really, really, really simple thing, which is to literally just duplicate a covering array with index one. So this is theta log k rows. And I can just do it a whole bunch of times. So then if I just literally duplicate the array lambda times, and each time I take log k rows, then that proves that I will use at most lambda times log k times a constant that's hidden by the V and T here, number of rows. But then is that the absolute best that you can do? And it turns out that it's not. So if we look at what the lower bound can be, we can easily show that can TKV with index lambda is big omega log K plus lambda. No matter what you do, it must be at least linear in lambda plus the log K that we've seen before. And why is this true? So suppose that we take any old covering array, so this is covering array of index one, and we know it must take at least log K rows in order to do that because the true number is always a constant times log k, 
So no matter what you do, you must have at least log k rows at all, because that's the best possible answer that you can do anyway, so you can't do any better than that. But in order to complete this to a covering array with index lambda, each thing in here must be covered at least once, and so therefore something in here must be covered exactly once. And so there's some interaction, let's say it's this one right here, and with some values, maybe zeros in all of them, but it doesn't matter. In order to be able to complete that, to have everything covered at least lambda times, this interaction must appear again lambda minus one more times. And so therefore, I need at least lambda minus one more rows right here. Right here, I need at least lambda minus one more rows. Because I have to have a minimum of log k here plus lambda minus one here, so then that will easily prove that we need at least linear in lambda to do this last part, and log k because that's the proof for normal covering arrays part. So therefore we need at least this amount, and it suffices to have at most that amount. Let's summarize what we have. What we have is that can lambda tkv is at most, I'm gonna suppress the constant here, lambda times log k, and it's at least log k plus lambda. And it's not immediately obvious that where the true bound actually is, whether it's all the way down here, or whether it's up here, or somewhere in between. And my conjecture was, it's gonna be down here. And there's fairly good reason to suspect that this is the case. So let me give you some history as to the bounds that we can obtain. So can lambda tkv obviously is at most log k plus lambda. That's the bound that we just proved. So the next best bound that was proven was by Godbully, uh, Skipper, and Sunley. And what they were able to show was that can lambda tkv, and there are some things I'm going to suppress to make things easy, is uh, log k plus lambda times log log k plus some smaller things that are not so important. And what I was able to show in my dissertation was that uh, something very similar. So I didn't work with covering arrays specifically, but I got basically the same bound, but by a completely different method. And both of these, so uh, GSS and me, use the, something called the probabilistic method. And this is the method that I used in the previous video to show that covering arrays are logarithmic in growth in terms of the number of columns. And so this probabilistic method is actually really good. The thing is, is that in my dissertation, I used basically the most crude approximation possible, and it was not competitive at all and because I didn't happen to know any advanced technique. So what I showed this year is that covering array number lambda tkv is that it's logarithmic in k plus lambda. And we showed before that it must be at least that number, and what I'm going to show here is that it's at most that number, so therefore this is asymptotically tight. There's no way to improve this without improving the VT parameters. And in every case here, V and T are held as constants. So let me give you some intuition as to how you can actually prove this. Okay, so how do you use the probabilistic method? What you do is you count the expected number of interactions in a randomized array. So if we have a random array right here, and by random I mean you make an array of size n by k, which is the parameters that you want, and you solve for n at the end to be the minimum possible to get the criteria that you want. So here, each of the entries is going to be one of v possible values completely randomly picked. And what we want to figure out is the expected number of interactions that are going to be not lambda covered, so that will not appear at least lambda times. And if you stare at it long enough, it's going to be k choose t times v to the t. And instead of one minus something to the end that we had last time, that's going to be the sum from i equals zero to lambda minus one of n choose i, p to the i, one minus p to the n minus i. This is a fairly well-known sum. And p here is one over v to the t. And I'm using p here just to make things easy. 
So there's absolutely no way I'm going to go through every single step. You can look at the preprint for that. But all that you need to do, all that you need to do, is to solve for n in this equation for when this is less than 1. So as long as this equation on the left-hand side is less than 1, then we can guarantee the existence of a covering array with n rows. The problem here is that n is in a sum, and it's hard to extract n out of a sum like this because n appears in a binomial coefficient right here and in the exponent here. And so therefore, n is going to be in the base of something and in the power of something else. And so it's kind of hard to extract n out of that. And in fact, there's no, as far as I can tell, analytical way of solving for this explicitly. So what we do is we find an upper bound that's not too bad on this sum, and that's a lot easier to solve. So what we do, or at least what I do, is I take this equation right here, and I'm going to split it in half. So I'm going to look at this part right here on the left and this part on the right and use something called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is we have uh, something right here being multiplied by something else in a sum. And what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is to split a part as sum that has cross-correlation between this thing and this thing, which you don't necessarily know when one is big and one is small, and separate them out so that you can focus only on this, a sum of this, and then separately, a sum on only this. And then you pay a little bit of a penalty, but now you can split that cross-correlation into self-correlations, which are a lot easier to handle. So I apply Cauchy-Schwartz. So then what you're going to get is something like k choose t times v to t times some sum of binomial coefficients, and then another sum that's based on powers, and then this is obviously less than 1. So then what you do here is that you can solve this exactly. So the one that is just in terms of powers, you can plug into Wolfram Alpha and verify it, obviously, but you can solve it exactly, which is really nice. And for this one, so we don't know a whole lot about partial sums of binomial coefficients, so what we do here is we apply an upper bound on this particular sum. Okay, so then what you're going to get is k choose t, v to the t, times some upper bound on this, which is going to be, in this case, I happen to get uh, n times uh, e, that, that number e, divided by lambda to the power lambda, times uh, 1 minus p to the something n minus lambda, something like this, times something small. And then that's less than 1. So then, now we've basically reduced this problem to n to the power lambda, so it's going to be something times n to the lambda times some other number to the power n uh, is less than 1. All I'm doing here is taking everything else that doesn't involve n at all and then just wrapping it up into a constant, let's call it a or something. And then now, what we want to do is we want to figure out what value of n causes this to be less than 1. And so now, here comes the big trick and it's something called the Lambert W function. Okay, here are some coordinate axes, and now I'm going to draw the Lambert W function to understand how to find an upper bound on n for the covering array number. So what it looks like is like this. So it's pretty low, it's pretty uh, logarithmic right here, it passes through the origin, and then makes a sharp turn right here, and then it makes another turn and asymptotically goes down to zero uh, on the negative side. And it turns out, if you really study this equation in terms of what we had before, so k choose t times v to the t times n e over lambda to the lambda times blah 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 other stuff less than 1, what you'll find is that if you actually solve this in terms of the Lambert equation, it's, it's going to be in this range right here. So it's going to be it's going to be negative, and it's going to be before this little inflection point on the left. What is the Lambert function specifically? So imagine the plot, I'm going to have a function f that takes in a number x, and that's going to be x times e to the x. So that is an equation, I don't know necessarily what it looks like, I'm not going to draw it here, but the Lambert function is the inverse of this. So in the inverse of this function f is the Lambert function which is what I've drawn here. So if you analyze it, you're going to be over here in this region. And so what you can immediately see is that 
if we have some particular value for w, which is going to be over here, so something like this right here, what you'll see is that you'll have a higher solution in the Lambert function and a lower solution. If you have two solutions, it might be really hard to distinguish, well, is this one the correct one or is this one the correct one? And one of the reasons why this work took so long is that I just looked at what Wolfram Alpha gave me and it told me, ah, the top solution, that's the one that you want. But then I kept plugging it into actual values and I was getting completely wrong answers and I had no idea why until I researched more and it's like, oh, this bottom one makes a lot more sense. And so what you need to do if you're going to be proving asymptotics like this is to show that this top solution cannot possibly occur. And all that you do is you look at basic properties of this Lambert function and show if you pick the top solution, then you are going to have fewer than the requisite number of rows. So every covering array must have at least lambda times v to the t rows, always. Because lambda, you must have lambda copies of every single thing, and there are v to the t things that you need to find, and so therefore you must have at least that many rows. But it turns out that if you pick that top solution, no matter where it is, you will always have fewer than lambda times v to the t rows, and so you can instantly throw it away. You must be in this regime right here, which is after this little inflection point over here and on this bottom curve. So what you eventually get if you work through all the details is something like n is less than or equal to lambda times w of some horrible stuff. So a really horribly looking complicated equation, right? And there are like seven minus signs is incredibly complicated, but you have to work through all the details, which is really annoying. And what you see here is that we have n in terms of this function w. And there's one additional thing that I even forgot here is that this lambda is going to be over something negative, which is something that I actually had a bit of trouble with when I was working through this the first time. Uh, when I was trying to prove this, is that there was a negative sign out here, and I was getting these negative answers for some reason, which did not make any sense. But there is something negative here. So this will make sense. Let's do a sanity check, because lambda's positive, there's something negative down here, and the w function in this regime right here is negative because it's below the x-axis. And so negative down here, negative up here, is going to give a positive number. That's good. Um, and it turns out that if you look at the values that this gets, it is fairly reasonable, but you need to be able to prove it. So in order to be able to prove this, that this is really the right asymptotics, what we need are lower bounds on the W equation. So notice that we have an upper bound on N, but why do we want a lower bound on W so that we can find the true asymptotics of this? Because the W function outputs something negative. And so therefore, if I put a stronger, or the terminology is not great here, but if I have something more negative here, then that's going to give me a bigger result at the end, which is going to be an upper bound on n, which is fine as long as it matches asymptotics. And it turns out that it did. And there are bazillions of upper bounds on the w function out there, and I needed to find one, and it turns out it wasn't that hard to find. But as long as you find a lower bound on this, so lower bound, once you find a lower bound on w, then you are fine, and you have proven that the covering array number is logarithmic in k and linear in lambda additively. And so therefore, you have finally proven a conjecture in combinatorics and discrete math. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about this conjecture and its proof into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.